let's get welcome back and uh, so until now uh, we discussed about the properties at, at zero Kelvin that means uh, we were trying to find the minimum of the uh, minimum point of the uh, uh, potential energy and uh, it uh, gives us the lattice equilibrium lattice parameter and uh, elastic properties okay so now uh, now from now on we are going to uh, give a little bit of the heating to the system and uh, try to simulate the system at a finite temperature okay and uh, we are going to uh, separate the solid and the liquid and uh, in the solid we will look at various equilibrium properties like a velocity distribution and heat capacity at constant volume and thermal expansion coefficient and impurity diffusion and also the annealing method to find the global minimum of the, uh, the specific configuration. And uh, next week we will uh, look at this liquid and try to find some of the information that is characteristic of the liquid like the latency function and also diffusion coefficient. Okay, so uh, as an introduction, uh, first what we can study with the fine temperature simulations. Okay, so there are two uh, purposes we usually we have in, in uh, simulating at finite temperature. Uh, the first one is to extract its equilibrium properties at finite temperature. For example, the free energy, which is very important for us. Uh, in this case, so from the finite temperature simulation, we can somehow extract the information about the, about the entropy Although we are not going to explicitly evaluate the entropy, but there is uh, some thermodynamic method to, uh, to extract uh, the information on the entropy. And also by uh, giving the temperature, by including, or, uh, by including this temperature, uh, we can simulate the various phases, not just solid, but also liquid as well as gas, gas phases. And also, uh, we can look at this uh, thermal expansion and heat capacity, and also uh, the phase transition at a certain temperature. Okay. Uh, besides these equilibrium properties, we are also we often uh, carry out the finite temperature and the simulations to uh, look at how the atoms move at a given temperature, or the so-called dynamical properties. For example. Uh, So for example, uh, in this example, uh, this is the, uh, oh, this shows the, wait, the diffusion motion of the copper clock complex on a silicon dioxide surface, all right? Uh, it is fun, it is uh, you know, basically fun to look at how the atoms move around at such a small time scale, all right? Uh, and from these simulations, you can understand how the foam bonds are formed and broken as the clusters diffuse, and also the, how these, uh, you know, the various side chains move uh, around these copper metal atoms. Okay, so you can, uh, can basically uh, understand every details of the atomic motion for the given specific uh, atomic processes. Okay, so it is it's hugely, uh, hugely uh, informative simulation. Right, and uh, quantitatively, you can extract this atomic diffusion and also the structural evolution uh, from A phase to B phase, or annealing and quenching by changing the temperatures. All right, so there are various purposes. Then, uh, how can uh, and there are various types of the simulation condition that we can impose on in these finite temperature simulations, and actually, uh, uh, they are. Uh, in parallel with the thermodynamic systems that you have, may have learned in the text, thermodynamic textbook. Uh, for example, in the case of this isolated system in which the atom, the number of the atoms and also the volume are actually fixed, okay? And, uh, and also it is isolated completely from the environment. So there is no exchange of the energy nor exchange of the matter, all right? So we call this kind of simulation as 
the microcanonical simulation ensemble or microcanonical simulation or MVE ensemble or MVE simulations. And here N means constant number of atoms. The V is constant V volume and E is constant energy. Since your system is completely uh, apart from the environment, the energy is conserved, right? So the energy is also constant in this simulation. So this is why we call it MVE ensemble or MVE simulations. Or uh, since it is, uh, uh, it is, it does not allow this energy of the exchange of the energy, so we call it adiabatic simulations. All right, so that's the, uh, the first type of the simulations. Uh, in the second type, you can also the simulate this, uh, the closed system. The closed system means that you allow the exchange of the energy, but you prohibit the exchange of the matter, right? So number of the atoms in your system is fixed, but it somehow exchange energy with the environment. And there are actually various types of the energy. There can be heat, heat, okay? So uh, random motion of the atoms, and also there is a mechanical work or electrical energy, etc. So there are various kinds of the energy. So depending on which one you allow to transfer or you are prohibit the transfer, then uh, there are various types of the simulation that comes from uh, uh, under this closed system simulations. Uh, in the case of the NVT simulations, you have so, uh, still have the constant number of atoms, constant and the volume, but you allow this, the temperature can vary, okay? So uh, there is an uh, energy exchange with the heat bath in the form of the heat, okay? So that's what we call MVT simulations, or we uh, uh, call it canonical ensemble. Uh, or you can allow this, the volume of a system change, okay? So in this case, somehow it can do the mechanical uh, work uh, depending on the external pressure, and so, uh, in this case, we call it NPT simulations, okay? NPT simulation or NPT ensemble. In the most uh, general system or open system, you allow both the energy and the matter uh, can uh, come and go from the environment, okay? So in this case, the number of the atoms can, even the number of the atoms can change as well as the uh, pressure and the temperature and we call it Grand Canonical Ensemble. Uh, this Grand Canonical Ensemble is very difficult to simulate within the molecular dynamic simulations. So uh, usually uh, people use uh, kinetic Monte Carlo, the Monte Carlo simulations to allow this, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the change of the number of the atoms. Okay? So in the molecular dynamic simulations, we always, we usually fix the number of atoms like uh, uh, MVT or MVE or MV, uh, MPT, ensemble simulations, okay? All right, so uh, we will mainly focus on NVT simulations in which you have the constant number of atoms, but it's still in contact with the thermal bath at temperature T. And the T, you can change the temperature, all right? So that means that there is an exchange of the energy between the system and the bath, all right? So the, since the, uh, the energy is uh, uh, you know, transferred from the environment, it means that your internal energy is a little bit fluctuate, right? These atoms uh, you know, at the environment, actually they are vibrate, and so they are you know, from this kinetic collision, kinetic collision with the, uh, the environment, the, the atoms in your, the energy of your system can somehow vary, all right? So they fluctuate in time. There's such an energy exchange between the environment and the system is actually simulated by the hypothetical thermostat. The thermostat means that it's the, uh, uh, some of the, uh, the device that you change the, or you control the temperature. That is called the thermostat, okay? Or in Korean, 자동 온도 조절 장치. All right. So, uh, and there are various types of the thermostat, uh, depending on who has invented it, like Langjabang or Berensen or and the Nose Huber. Among them, the Nose Huber is the most popular form of the, uh, the thermostat. And I will uh, uh, discuss that in more detail here. So Nose and Huber introduced uh, the fictitious parameter S in the dynamics, which effectively couples the system to the heat bath. Okay? That means that, so uh, if there is a particle 
with the mass m and the velocity of the dr over dt, then usually the momentum is the, the simply the, the multiplication of the mass and the velocity. All right? But in here, in the nose of thermostat, we have a one more parameter that is multiplied, that is connecting this nv and the momentum. All right? So, uh, and your Hamiltonian, so Hamiltonian means the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. It consists of the uh, kinetic and the potential energy of the atoms and Hamiltonian of the S parameter, the hypothetical some other parameter. All right? And here this HS consists of the kinetic energy of the S and the potential energy of S, which is the, uh, the EQ over PS square plus some of the uh, this uh, term, potential term, that depends on the temperature that you want to impose your system. All right, and here the L is the three times number of atoms plus one, okay? So this total degree of freedom plus one. All right, so this is the basic Hamiltonian. From the Hamiltonian, we can derive the equation of the motion, okay? And the first line here, the result is uh, as follows. And uh, the first line is the dynamics of the particle, all right? The particle, and the, this is the, the acceleration is ms square uh, fi over ms square, all right? So usually, uh, there is the s is one, right? So p is equal to mv, and so this is the other nothing but f equal ma, right? The, the acceleration is first divided by the mass, right? But you, here you have the one parameter as it comes in here, and more importantly, there's a second term, which looks like a dissipation, right? So uh, this, if the, this, this, uh, this is constant or the positive, it is negatively proportional to the velocity, right? Which is the, nothing but the friction, all right? Okay, so through this term, if this is positive, this coefficient is positive, then the particle will lose the, uh, the velocity, right? Or it slow down, okay? Uh, but if the, uh, this, this S is negative, then reversely, it will obtain the velocity from the environment, from the S parameter here, okay? So depending on this, uh, the, the sign of this coefficient, then this term can slow down or kicking the atoms or give them more velocity to the atoms, right? So uh, if it is cooled down or it, this kinetic energy is somehow lower than uh, that expected from the certain temperature, then it will boost up the velocity by kicking the atoms or if it is, is too, too fast, then it will uh, slow down by through the, this uh, friction term, all right? So this second term is mainly control the velocity of your, the particle. And this S is not a static parameter, but it also it has its own dynamics uh, in the second line. It has a mass of the Q, and uh, it has the second right-hand side is correspond to the force that drives S, and it, ha it is, uh, uh, somehow you can, uh, can understand that this is the, uh, the kinetic energy of the, your uh, total system, total kinetic energy, which should be proportional to temperature, of that uh, system, and from the difference, if it differs the temperature that you impose your system, that somehow this S has some of the value, or it has the, uh, some of the, uh, the numbers that changing with time, okay? And it will affect the, the dynamics of your system, okay? So, you know, simply put, uh, if your kinetic energy average temperature of your system is different from the one you impose your uh, simulation, then this S will comes in, and it will, depending on the speed of your particle, it will kick or the slow down your the atoms, right? So this is a mechanism how uh, this S controls the, uh, the velocity of your, of your system, okay? And there's one parameter here, which is the Q, which is the, uh, the mass of the uh, hypothetical parameter S. So if the small Q, the Q is small, then it means that this S is rapidly respond to the difference of the temperature difference, right? Target temperature and your system temperature. So it will, you know, rapidly, very quickly adjust your temperature, all right? On the other hand, if the Q is large, which means that the S is 
they're very heavy. Uh, so, uh, so it will very slowly respond to the temperature difference. Okay, so there should be some of the optimal value uh, that you can, uh, you can set in your system that we will discuss later. All right, so let's compare uh, this, uh, the law of the effect of the, this thermostat with the example of this water molecule, the simpler one water molecule, and this oxygen is more or less fixed in space. And in the left-hand side, it is NVE ensemble simulation, which means uh, it is a, it's constant energy. So you, it will simply, it will look very natural, right? So it's a simple vibration of the hydrogen atoms around the oxygen atoms, right? So nothing, nothing particular, right? Nothing suspicious here. It's a plain dynamics, all right? On the other hand, this is MVT ensemble simulations. Then you can see it's just a little bit different, right? So a little bit strange. Sometimes it slows down, and it's not like rapidly vibrating. So irregular motion, right? So that means that uh, at some point, uh, the thermostat comes in and it slows down, and sometimes it comes in and kicks the atoms, right? So a little bit irregular. So it emulates this uh, uh, random collision with the heat bath. You understand? So that's the, uh, the effect of MVT simulation. All right, so uh, let's look at this solid. So uh, our favorite system, the silicon carbide. And uh, here we simulate this uh, finite solid at finite temperature by making use of this supercell that is repeated five times, five times, five times along uh, each direction. And here we will use MVT ensemble simulations, which is reflected in line here, MVT ensemble simulations. And uh, we are going to use a Nose-Huber thermostat, uh, which will be uh, uh, somehow reflected in, uh, which is that, uh, NH, this is Nose-Huber? Or option or the other? We are still, we, we trigger this nose huber. It's default? Ah, okay, so nose huber is a default, so you do not need to set anything. All right, uh, and uh, there's one parameter here that I mentioned before is Q, and it is uh, actually uh, in the simulations, it is replaced one, uh, this parameter, the, the time constant of the damping, T damp, and uh, which is proportional to the Q, okay? And uh, uh, according to the the manual, it is recommended that uh, this damping time is, uh, is about 10 to 100 times of the time step, which is uh, usually one femtosecond. Okay, and uh, you provide the initial velocity, right? Uh, here, the initial so, uh, temperature is uh, 1200 Kelvin, and you put one random seed to give the random velocity and your, the temperature is controlled in, uh, at this line. And the 600 is the initial temperature during the simulation, and the 600 is final temperature. And that means that you can actually control, you can lamp up your temperature uh, with the time, or you can cool down, okay? That is possible uh, in this, uh, by controlling, by deferring these two numbers here, okay? But here, uh, our target temperature is 600 Kelvin, all right? And this, uh, this is the damping time uh, is in the unit of the picosecond. Since our time step is one femtosecond by default, and so uh, by a 10 or so, uh, this 0.101 picosecond means the 10 femtosecond, all right? All right, and so the other lines you will learn uh, during, the, during the, the practice session. And it, Basically, it extracts the information of the velocity uh, during the simulation. All right, and this is what it looks like. Okay, uh, this is the movie, a uh, silicon carbide, and this is super size and at the 600 Kelvin. And the result is, oh. All right, okay, this is it. No, just atomic random vibration, okay? So that's it. And since the, uh, the, the 600 is still well below the melting temperature, 
then of course you have you just look at this uh, you know the random vibration of the solid that's it okay uh, let's look at a little bit more details uh, first energy uh, this figure shows the average kinetic energy per atom all right and you can see some of the fluctuation along the time so this x axis is the time or in the number of the steps or in the unit of the femtosecond. So you have carried out uh, about five picosecond simulation. All right? But if you uh, amplify this initial time here, then this is what it looks like. And it started from the high temperature and it rapidly comes down and it is somehow fluctuates and on average it is the, uh, the energy is smaller than the initial kinetic energy, all right? Okay, so uh, during this time, your system is somehow adjusted. So since, because you have uh, provided some of the non-equilibrium velocity distribution in the beginning, so uh, it takes a little time to equilibrate, okay? So, and after this equilibration time, you can see, even though there is uh, some of the fluctuations, this is always natural and always, you cannot eliminate this. So this, the, uh, there is a little bit more or less uniform uh, distribution. So uh, this initial time is called equilibration time. So in any kind of the simulation, you have to first equilibrate your system because your initial uh, starting configuration is usually away from the equilibrium. All right. So you need some of the time, and it can, and you can. It depends on the, uh, your system. In this case, we are the solid, right? Solid, and so it in equilibrates a very a short time, like uh, within you know one picosecond. This is very, uh, very fast. On the other hand, if you look at this, the potential energy here, uh, then in this during this equilibration time, you can see that it first starts from the minus six point one six electron volt, which is actually the energy at the, uh, the absolute minimum, all right, or uh, those structure at the zero Kelvin. All right, so this is the, uh, the, the minimum point here. And you have uh, now, since your atoms are moving around, of course it will uh, move around away from the equilibrium point. That's why you see here, the energy is, the potential energy increases and equilibrate at a certain uh, the value, all right? In other words, your initial, some of the, your initial kinetic energy is now transferred for, uh, to the potential energy, right? So in the beginning, we had just the uh, uh, minimum potential energy and the kinetic energy. And the, through the equilibration, we have somehow equally uh, distribute your kinetic energy and the potential energy, right? So that's why, even though you have started from the 1200 Kelvin uh, the velocity here, but you end up with the 600, more or less you are end up with the 600 Kelvin. Of course, the, uh, this is controlled by the thermostat. All right, and how about the temperature? Uh, since we have controlled the temperature through the thermostat, it should be, uh, should be the, uh, the target temperature or the 600 Kelvin, but we will check that explicitly here. The temperature in the simulation is according to the equipartition theorem, the average kinetic energy is uh, three over two times uh, kT, all right? So uh, you are divided with this mean kinetic energy by uh, with a 1.5 uh, Boltzmann constant, then you have this, uh, your system in your uh, temperature in your system, okay? And you can say that if you average your temperature uh, uh, during the last three picosecond, then you can see that the average temperature is around 600 Kelvin, which is exactly uh, the temperature that you want to impose your system. The same as the target temperature. All right, so this is well controlled. And uh, you can change this damping time, damping time over the mass of the thermostat, and let's see uh, how it will change. And so this is uh, what we have now. And if you increase your, the damping time, it's 0.1, then you can see that the temperature is respond or it varies more slowly, right? And here it is more rapidly, but it is uh, changing, you know, more uh, a little bit longer time scale. And in this case, the damping of the 0.5, you can see the very slow the time variation. 
All right. Yeah. 하고, 하고 proportional 하는 거야. 그러니까 Q가 앞에서 우리가 했던 이그 온도를 조절을 하는 S 파라미터. 그 S 파라미터의 그 무게, 가상적인 파라미터죠. 무게를 결정하는 파라미터고, 그거를 비례하는 겁니다. 그래서. 아, 그러니까 얘가 크다는 거는 얘가 이제 Q가 무거운 거니까 S가 천천히 변한다는 얘기고, 그래서 온도가 천천히 이렇게 변하게 되는. 그러니까 얘가, 얘는 항상 600 켈빈을 이제 맞추려고 하는데, 안 맞아 있으면 그걸 갖다가 이제 빠르게 이제 막 이렇게 간섭을 해가지고, 빠르게 빠르게 맞추는 게첫 번째라고 하면은, 세 번째 경우에는 처음에 조금 이제 속도가 이제 너무 빨라가지고 이제 쿨다운을 하는데, 좀 그게 좀 느린 거죠. 이렇게 좀 천천히 일어나는 거고, 또 쿨다운 하다 보면 또 일부는 또 이제 올라가면 다시 또, 또 쿨다운 하고 이런 식의 조절을 하는 거가 좀 약간 느리게 반응을 해가지고, 어, 저런 이제 위글리한 약간 느, 느린 이런, 이런 커브가 나오는 거예요. Alright, so the certainly uh, it, this kind of the slow the temperature variation is, is, is an artifact of the, Earth, uh, uh, the thermostat. So it would be more desirable to have this kind of the more constant uh, temperature variation. Alright? Alright, uh, and how about if you increase the uh, cell size? Uh, then uh, so far we have seeing this result on the 5x5, five five. but if you reduce your the supposed size, then you can see that the fluctuation, the temperature fluctuation, is actually increases. And if, but if you increase your supposed size, that is to say if you are simulate, uh, your simulation becomes more and more realistic, right? Uh, in this case, you can see that this fluctuation is smaller and smaller, all right? So, in the thermodynamic, where uh, you have the almost infinite size of your system, so in here, this we are imposing the period boundary condition, so uh, it is repeated. This uh, vibration is repeated every you know, 10 lattice spacing. But uh, in the ideal case, or in the realistic uh, situation, uh, this n should be goes to infinite. In this case, in, the, in this limit, you may expect that this fluctuation is almost a zero, right? So at that there, we have exactly 600 Kelvin, right? It does not fluctuate with the time. So this is well known uh, the theorem in the thermodynamics that the temperature fluctuation is become suppressed at the larger system, right? And this temperature is actually a concept that you can apply for the you know, macroscopic system where you have uh, Avogadro number of atoms, all right? All right. And uh, uh, you can look at this uh, velocity distribution of your atoms. So the initially, initially uh, this is your first initial velocity distribution. And as the time goes on, the shape changes. And finally, uh, after equilibration, you have more or less the, the uh, constant distribution of the velocity. Okay? And actually, this may remind you of the well-known the so-called Maxwell distribution. And if you change your temperature, like if you uh, lower, cool down the temperature, then this velocity distribution that becomes the green to the blue to red one. And this is exactly what is uh, formulated in this Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. This is 400 Kelvin, this is yeah, 200 Kelvin, this is 100 Kelvin. All right? And this is exactly reproduced during our simulation, right? So, you know, this is because this is a, you know, such a distribution is a consequence of statistical mechanics, all right? And so our system should uh, follow the result, right? If our the simulation was carried out you know, reasonably, okay? Uh, but such a steady distribution does not mean that every atom has a certain only one velocity. If you trace one, if you pick up one particular atom, if you trace this uh, a temperature or the kinetic energy as a function of the time, then you can see that it rapidly changes. Sometimes it is lower than, the temperature is lower than the 600 Kelvin, and sometimes it is uh, higher than uh, its average temperature, right? So. Every atom, you know, sometimes it just moves slowly, rapidly, and, and on, on average, uh, temperature is always 600, but there is always uh, significant 
the fluctuation is in energy, kinetic energy, or is the temperature. All right. Okay. So bear in mind that you know your the atoms are always changing its velocity. So if you want to uh, simulate MVE ensemble, then you can simply switch your uh, the line, one of the line here, this MVT to MVE. Then you are triggering MVE ensemble simulations. And uh, if we look at this result, uh, this is the total energy per atom. In the case of the MVT ensemble simulation, you have seen that the total energy is fluctuates. Right? Because the, the thermostat always interfere the motion, so sometimes so uh, its energy is fluctuating. But this is the uh, the constant energy simulations or adiabatic simulations. So its energy should be conserved. Right? It's constant, right? Uh, so uh, you can see that this red line here is almost constant. But after five picosecond simulation, you have the slight increase in the total energy. Right by about uh, 1.4 millib per atom, which is certainly noticeable in this picture here, and this slight increase is actually uh, is a consequence of the approximation of the finite uh, time step. Right, so it means that the delta t equal one femtosecond second does not conserve your time because of the uh, you know your the algorithm does not guarantee uh, the conservation of the uh, of the energy. Uh, with this time step, right? And so uh, in this case, if you reduce your time step by half, like a 0.5 femtosecond, you can see that uh, this energy change is almost a negligible, 0.1 milliEV, right? So uh, this is actually typically one of the tests that we go through when we determine the time step, right? For, so the time step, if the, so the, the larger time step will be beneficial for your the fast simulations. But somehow, if you increase it, then your total energy will drift. It increases, right? So during your simulation, so if your simulation time is short, that's fine. But if you want to the long time simulation, okay, not just the five picosecond, but let's say one nanosecond, then uh, this amount of the, uh, the energy increase could be significant, right? So in that case, you have to reduce your time step, you know, such that your total energy well conserved, right? So this is one of the tests that we go through when we determine the appropriate or proper time step. All right? And how about the, the temperature? The temperature, every temperature is the kinetic energy divided by 1.5 Boltzmann constant, which uh, in the case of the MVE ensemble, you have the more of, you have the, uh, the almost constant temperature, uh, and its average temperature is about 580 uh, Kelvin. And in the case of the MVT, it was adjusted to 600 Kelvin, and uh, this uh, and also has the uh, the certain level of the fluctuation. All right. So this means that basically MVE and MVT are almost identical simulations. If you carry out just was uh, for a fixed temperature, all right, uh, as long as your total energy is somehow somehow adjusted or set such that the temperature, every temperature, is the same as the target temperature, all right? And some people, uh, for that reason, some people actually prefer MVE over MVT because uh, in this case, MVT ensemble simulations, the thermostat, you know, is interfering with the atomic motion. Sometimes it slows down, it's kicking the atoms, which may affect the dynamics of the system, all right? So at the constant temperature simulation, some people prefer the MVE over MVT. But the thermostat is usually, uh, usually uh, uh, very uh, convenient if you, control, if you want to control the temperature during the simulation, such as you know, quenching, or if you want to melt in your the system, then you have to increase your temperature right, gradually. And then you know, MVT is certainly much more convenient than MVE ensemble simulations. All right. And during the practice session, you will uh, learn about you know, how, did, how to produce this velocity distribution. OK. And uh, I go on. All right. OK. Uh, the next topic is about the heat capacity. 
heat capacity. We can calculate the heat capacity. And here, uh, you can do both constant volume and a constant pressure. But here, for simplicity, we uh, deal with only the constant volume simulations. All right, so uh, the heat capacity at a constant volume. Uh, heat capacity means that it's the energy, energy or the thermal energy that you have to provide to increase one degree of your system. All right? And if it is the volume is fixed, then it's a CV. Uh, and if the pressure is fixed, then it's a CP, constant pressure, heat capacity. And here the energy means the kinetic energy plus potential energy or the internal energy, right? Since the volume is fixed, the, all the heat that is provided by the heat belt is goes totally to the internal energy, not the mechanical work like the P delta V. And so uh, during the simulation, if you just uh, plot this average total energy uh, at a different temperature, then you have this you know, fairly linear behavior, okay? And the slope, it gives you the heat capacity, all right? So uh, in this energy in electron volt and temperature K, the slope is about you know, 0 0.0002 uh, 59 LeV per Kelvin. And if you convert it to joule per mole per Kelvin, then you have to uh, multiply you know, the Boltzmann constant and the other number. And since there are two atoms, the silicon and the carbon per unit cell, so uh, overall, uh, it gives you the 50 uh, joule per mole per Kelvin. All right? OK. Uh, however, actually, this is a somehow some trivial result because uh, you know, we already know from the equipartition theorem that classically, the heat capacity is always uh, the degree of, uh, number of the degree of uh, freedom uh, times uh, gas constant R. Okay, so in this case, we have the two atoms here, so 3R times 2, so it is equal to 49.8, which is almost the same as the, what we obtained from the numerically. All right? So this is called the dual petit rule. So your system is a classical system, so classical simulation should follow the result of the, uh, the classical thermodynamics. So for instance, in the previous example, we have seen that the, the velocity distribution is exactly follows the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And in this case, we have seen that the heat capacity is exactly what is predicted by this uh, dulong petit rule. All right? So this is a little bit trivial result. But what is the other real system? So in the real system, uh, so this is experimental data uh, that is published in this reference. And the uh, heat capacity actually, it depends on the temperature, right? Uh, and at a high temperature, a very high temperature, uh, this heat capacity is indeed, indeed is equal to the, uh, the what approaches what is expected from the classically uh, or Julian Petit rule, uh, and it approaches the, uh, the, the, okay, so it is a little bit, uh, disappear here, but it's a six. So it approaches a six here. Uh, but at the lower temperature, it is significantly suppressed. And the near the zero Kelvin, it becomes a zero. All right? So uh, you may know that uh, this is the, uh, the result of the quantum effect. Your the phonon vibration is that, OK, so this CV, or heat capacity, is, uh, comes from the uh, thermal vibration, or the phonon vibration. And this, uh, such a vibration is suppressed uh, because of the finite energy difference of the vibration, H times the frequency. OK? So, uh, you may know that uh, so there is a Debye model which, uh, sim uh, which describes such a heat capacity of the phonon uh, system. And you can see that, that it well fits the experimental data. Okay? And at, three, at 300 Kelvin, this heat capacity is yeah, only the 26.6 joule per mole per Kelvin, which is much, more, much smaller than uh, the classical value. All right? So this is one difficulty in the classical dynamic simulations. So in a classical dynamic simulations, you are populating or you are populating your phonon modes too much, right? You populate all of the phonon modes, but in reality, because of the quantum effect, it should be significantly suppressed. But it is beyond the uh, scope of these classical dynamic simulations. That's one problem that we also discuss in the next topic. All right. So there is a way to, uh, to calculate such a heat capacity quantum mechanically 
uh, you can calculate this phonon vibration uh, or phonon spectrum, and there is a package or there is um, uh, some, some of the formalism. Uh, you can calculate the heat capacity from that uh, the phonon vibrational mode. Okay, that is already known. All right. Okay, so uh, then the next topic is thermal expansion coefficient. So the materials are usually expand at the finite temperature. Okay, that is actually the result of the uh, unharmony effect, which means that uh, if your system is a harmony, or if your lattice, if you compress as you compress or decompress your system, the your the energy of your solid will you know uh, be like that. Okay, so at the equilibrium, you know, this is equilibrium lattice parameter. If this potential well is symmetric or harmonic around the equilibrium point, then this vibration will not, so the average point, position, average point of this vibration will be all, always the same, all right? So you will not see any change in the lattice parameter. But uh, in real system, this potential is anharmonic. It's more soft to, to the outside, okay? So potential is more changes more uh, the slowly or the gradually, weakly uh, as you expand compared to your compression, all right? So because of this anharmonic effect or asymmetric effect, uh, as your material vibrates, the average position will move outside, okay? Which means that your the solid will expand, okay? So the thermal expansion is actually the, the result of the anharmonic effect, okay? So uh, this thermal expansion coefficient can be uh, calculated by, uh, you know, of course, during the MD simulation, we will see that. Uh, by just allowing your lattice parameter to be changed, then you can calculate your, the lattice parameter at a certain temperature. But the problem is that uh, at the lower temperature, as we've seen in the previous example, uh, at the lower temperature or at the room temperature or at the moderate temperatures, uh, because of this quantum effect, your MD simulation is not, uh, is not that accurate, or your, the phonon vibration is too much exaggerated, all right? So uh, in that case, at the low temperature or the medium temperature, you have to introduce explicitly uh, the, uh, the harmonic or no, not, it, it's the, the, the quantum nature of the phonon vibration. So there is an approximation known, known as the quasi-harmonic approximation. And using this uh, method, you can actually calculate uh, the thermal expansion coefficient at a low temperature, right? But it is not directly given from the simulations. You have to uh, calculate your phonon vibration at a different volume. And then, you know, there is a formalism that gives you the lattice expansion coefficient. But here we will uh, demonstrate this MD simulations, which is uh, becomes more and more accurate uh, at the temperature approaches the, uh, the melting point. All right, so it is accurate at high temperature. So the simulation is simply uh, allowing your lattice parameter to change with respect to the external pressure, right? So uh, MPT ensemble simulations, so depending on the pressure here, of course, the external pressure is usually one uh, atmospheric pressure, but which is almost, uh, you know, in, in the case of the solid, this is almost uh, uh, equivalent to the zero, uh, zero bar, okay? So you can set this as zero bar, and you can allow your lattice parameter change with respect to your stress, okay? And so it will fluctuate, and by taking the average over a certain period, then you can uh, say say the uh, you can you can obtain this average lattice parameter uh, at a certain uh, temperature, and if you examine the stress uh, during the simulations, then you can see that on average it is zero, which is the uh, it's stress free or external pressure is almost uh, zero. All right, so uh, this is the result. Uh, this is uh, the, the temperature, and this is the uh, uh, the average lattice parameter, you can see that it gradually uh, increases, right? It's emulating the uh, thermal expansion. And from the slope, you can see that the expansion coefficient, the linear expansion coefficient is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 5 per Kelvin. If you average over the 
uh, from the room temperature to 1000 Kelvin. And the right hand side, this is the, uh, the experimental data. Uh, and this is the ambient pressure. And you can see that uh, at lower temperature, the lattice expansion is quite suppressed, right? This is because of the quantum effect. But at the higher temperature, it changes linearly. Uh, and by taking this slope, this slope is uh, 4.45 times 10 to the minus 6 per Kelvin, okay, which is the uh, one third of the, uh, the, the theoretical estimation. All right, so uh, this is quite reasonable com uh, considering this is you know small scale of this number. All right, okay. So this is how you can obtain this thermal expansion or a linear expansion coefficient from the simulations. All right, and uh, during the exercise, you will practice the uh, coefficient for the aluminum. All right, the next topic is that uh, you can simulate the diffusion. Uh, this is solid, so you have the impurity, so the impurity diffusion uh, from the, uh, and the finite temperature simulations. So here, this example is you have the uh, this ARPA ion, the BCC structure, and this is the, uh, the, the violet, or the, 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 pink, the pink atom is the carbon atoms, okay? And so the carbon atoms will diffuse at this temperature, uh, 1300 Kelvin. So you can, from the movie, you can see that, you know, this, the pink atoms, you know, drifts uh, from time to time, changing its radius positions, okay? All right, so you are simulating the impurity diffusion within the solid. And uh, from the, uh, this mean square displacement, so this is the, uh, the, the square of the, the displacement from the original, temp original position uh, with respect to time. Uh, and you have this linear line here, and its slope is actually corresponding to, is proportional to diffusion coefficient. And if you divide it by the six, and this is the, uh, the, the diffusion coefficient for the carbon at this temperature is, is 1.4 times 10 to the minus 10 meters square per second, okay? And you can change your simulation temperature like a 900 and 1100 and 1300 Kelvin, and you plot and you obtain this uh, diffusion coefficient uh, as we have done before. Uh, and if you plot this uh, diffusion coefficient uh, in the log scale and uh, with respect to one of the inverse temperature, then you have this linear line, and the slope is actually from this, uh, you know, diffusion formula. Uh, you can see that uh, this activation energy of this uh, carbon diffusion uh, inside uh, this is ion is about 98 kilojoule per mole, right? Which is compares favorably with the experimental value of the 80 kilojoule per mole, all right? So this is one of the things, and this is a blue one. Uh, this is this. This blue one is the actual the experimental the data for the carbon diffusion in the alpha ion. Okay, not just the slope, but also the absolute value itself is quite in good agreement with the experiment. All right. Okay. So uh, this is one of the things that you can obtain this uh, from the from the simulations. This diffusion or uh, activation energy of the uh, of the uh, diffusion. All right. And uh, in the practice, you will calculate this quantity yourself. All right. Okay, so the final topic, the final topic is the, uh, the annealing. You can use this uh, finite temperature simulations in finding uh, the global, the minimum uh, of your the system. And this is called annealing method. All right, the idea is as follows. For instance, if you start from the uh, zero Kelvin uh, relaxation, let's say that you know, your the energy surface of your system is like that. And you are, start, you are starting from the, this, this position, the green one here, okay? And uh, from the relaxation at zero Kelvin, it will fall down to the, uh, uh, the, the minimum that is closest to, to the initial position, right? In this case, uh, here. All right, so this is the, the minimum, but you want to find the global minimum, which is truly 
the minimum along any configuration of space. All right. So uh, uh, in this case, uh, by uh, providing by uh, providing heat or from the M definite temperature simulations, you can you can simulate this or you can uh, vibrate or thermally vibrate your system from the local minimum. Right. You have seen it. Uh, in the uh, early case that uh, during the simulations, the atom, the velocity of the atoms actually uh, can, and can change a lot, right? Sometimes it has a very large kinetic energy. Uh, let's go back to, uh, you know, six. All right, so. Okay, so this is the, uh, the date. Uh, that sometimes, uh, the, this is a specific, the temperature of the specific atom, and sometimes its temperature is as high as 2,000 Kelvin, right? very high temperature, but sometimes it is lower than 600 Kelvin. So uh, statistically, uh, it, uh, it will gain quite high kinetic energy during the simulations, all right? So uh, we are exploiting the fact that most of the time, uh, your system will vibrate around the local minimum, but well, sometimes, very rarely, it will have a high kinetic energy, okay? That is enough that uh, you can go over the energy barrier and it goes to, uh, to another, the more uh, lower energy or the global minimum in the next uh, energy landscape, all right? So uh, this is the, uh, the main idea uh, behind this annealing method. Right, so this is zero capitalization, and this is annealing. All right, so for instance, uh, in the last week, we have seen that in the case of the split interstitial, there are various configurations are possible, right? And um, among them, tetragonal is the, uh, the global minimum uh, for the, uh, the potential, the of potential. Uh, but starting from the one on O split, you are end up with the one on O split, all right? So, uh, if you, starting from this 110 split interstitial, and if you carry out the simulation at 300 Kelvin over a time, you can see that uh, this configuration is now vibrates and, okay, it's changing into the tetragonal interstitial, all right? So, which is the, the truly the global minimum uh, in the interstitial configuration, all right? So, this is one of the useful ways to find uh, the true global minimum in a complicated uh, system. You can also use this uh, example to find uh, complicated uh, reconstruction the surface. For example, uh, oh, I don't know. Oh, I, I did not bring it here. But sometimes, so uh, in the case of the 100, surface reconstruction, you will see that after time, uh, your this uh, two by one reconstruction is, is established by itself, right? Because it is a global minimum. Okay. All right, so uh, that's the end of this, this part, the theory part. Any, any question? Um, today we will do some uh, finite temperature MD simulations. First, we will do MVT simulation of SIC and plot uh, velocity distribution of silicon atoms. So this is the script. And uh, we read uh, silicon carbide data and use terms of potential. And the uh, uh, first atom is carbon, and the second atom is silicon. Second atom type is silicon, and we will repl replicate the simulation box by 555. So we will be using supercell, and this velocity command create a random velocity that corresponds to a certain temperature. So velocity O means we will create assign a random velocity to all atoms and uh, which corresponds, corresponds to 800 Kelvin. And this next uh, number is the random seed. So 
you can use any value, but if you want to uh, simulate uh, simulate it many times with different results, you have to change this random seed each time. So when the random seed is same, the simulation result will be same. And this fixed MVT ensemble apply uh, MVT ensemble to the simulation. So this fixed MVT defaults used Doze Hubo thermostat. And if you want to use other thermostats, such as Langevang, you can use fixed MVE combined with other fixes. So if you look at uh, lamps menu, there is uh, other thermostats like fixed Langevang or fixed temporary scale. So here we will be using Noze Uber thermostat. And the temperature, the next two number is the temperature. So the first number is the temperature at the beginning of simulation. And the next number is the temperature at the end of the simulation. And the last last number is the damping parameter. So uh, this initial temperature and the final temperature apply to each run command. So if you set initial temperature as a 400 Kelvin and final temperature as uh, 800 Kelvin, then as time step goes on, the temperature will be changing from 400 to 800 Kelvin during the run command. So if you uh, use run 5000, the temperature profile will be like this. But if you use 5 run 1000 command, then this temperature profile is applied to each run. So the temperature profile will be like this, five times. And here we have a new uh, variable type, which is atom type. So this command uh, assign atom style variable. So the variable we have used before is uh, equal style variable. So so this is the uh, variable we used before. So this equal style variable assign a scalar value to the variable. However, we are using uh, atom style variable. So this atom style variable uh, is a vector value. So it has value for every atom in the simulation box. So if we have uh, four atoms in the simulation box with atom IDs 1, 2, 3, 4. And if they have uh, Vx, which is the x component of the velocity, like this. Then if we uh, write variable atom, something like this, then this mm, then this uh, variable B will be an array, which is like this. So we can refer to this, this atom style variable with V on the bar variable name to refer to this array, and we can refer to its 
element by this. So this uh, will refer to the first element. So the index starts with 1. So there are some predefined atom vectors, such as id, mass, time, mole, x, y, z, which is x, y, z coordinate, and v, x, v, y, v, z, uh, x, y, z component of velocity, and x, y, z component of force, and charge. Uh, so we can combine these predefined atom vectors with mass functions to create, uh, for example, velocity here. So we can define variable velocity atom and like this. Then we have a velocity uh, variable which contains velocity, all velocities of uh, all atoms in a array. Then we also have a new fix, which is AVE histo. This uh, fix commands uh, make histogram and print uh, histogram, averaged histogram. So, so there are uh, six numbers, uh, n every n repeat, n free frequency and low, high, and VIN. So it's easier to understand with examples. So if we use uh, AVE histo with 2, 6, 100, then the histogram at time step 100 will be calculated with uh, by averaging the values at time step 90, 92, 94, 96, 98, and 100. So we will be using six values. We will be averaging six values. And these six values are separated by uh, two time steps. And we will be calculating and uh, printing this information at every 100 steps. And the next three numbers indicate beam uh, settings. So if we write 0, 10, uh, 20, that means we will be beaming uh, the value from 0 to 10 range into 20 bins. And the next, we will uh, write which variable we want to average an histogram. So here we we are uh, printing histogram every thousand uh, steps using uh, thousand values, and we will be printing it from zero to twenty using fifty bins. So we are printing velocity into histogram. So if you ru run velo.in file, you can see it is calculating. But uh, since we are doing finite temperature simulations, usually simulation cell is large, so there are many atoms, and we are uh, calculating many time steps. So it takes more time than zero Kelvin calculation. So if you want to speed up your calculation, you can use uh, OpenMP, which will uh, parallelize your calculation using many CPU cores. So you can use it with writing hyphen SF, SF OMP, hyphen PK OMP, and the number of cores. So if you have a quad-core CPU, you can use four. By doing that, your simulation will 
run much faster. Uh, yeah, so I have prepared pre-calculated output file, which is prefixed with one. So we have velocity distribution here. So this is the output from fixed AV histo. So here you can see a header which is which contains time step and number of pins and total counts, vision counts, and beam max value. And then you can see uh, the pin index and the coordinates of pin and count and relative counts. So if you want to draw this histogram, you can draw second and third uh, column. As you can see, the velocity distribution follows Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. And you can do that for uh, different temperatures. And if you plot them in one graph, you can see you can reproduce this histogram. Next, we will calculate the uh, heat capacity of silicon carbide. Oh no, we will do thermal expansion coefficient of aluminum. So this is the script that calculates thermal expansion coefficient. So we uh, get structure data of aluminum by reading the data file, and we will be using EAM FS potential. Uh, and this time, we will also using 555 supercell. And we define two variables. The first one is the just temperature, which is predefined variable. And the second variable is uh, LX divided by 5. Lx is also predefined variable, which uh, means the box size, simulation box size in x direction. So since we have uh, replicated simulation box in the uh, x direction five times, so this Lx divided five will indicate uh, the lattice parameter of unicell. And then we will print this temperature and uh, latest parameter uh, average time average value of these variables. So here we have AVE time fix, which is similar to AVE histo, but this just uh, do time average and it does not make histogram. So these numbers are same as before. So we are printing average uh, time average value of these variables, these two variables, every 5,000 steps using 2,000 values. And we are printing it to e.dat file. Uh, and we will be using loop and we will set the temperature using this uh, loop variable. So we here we use NPT uh, fix, which make uh, 
NPT Ansango. So temperature will be from 50 Kelvin to 500 Kelvin. And here we have ISO 000.1. And this means, ISO means the temperature, uh, pressure is isotropic. That means PXX equals PYY equals PGG. That is hydrostatic pressure condition. And this last number, uh, first two numbers indicate the pressure at the initial uh, simulation and the pressure at the last simulation one. So this is same as uh, temperature command. And the last number is the damping parameter for pressure. So it is uh, similar to this temperature command. Uh, the damping parameter for pressure is recommended as 10 times larger than the temperature, damping parameter for temperature. And So we can run this script, but it will take some time. We have to run 50,000 steps. However, I uh, prepared the output. Which is 3E that death file. So here we can see uh, the time average values of temperature and lattice parameter. Uh, since we are changing temperature at every 5,000 uh, steps, this will correspond to uh, so if we plot the second and third row, you can reproduce this uh, figure. So by uh, calculating the slope in this figure, you can estimate the thermal expansion coefficient. Uh, next, we will calculate the diffusion coefficient of carbon in BCC ion at different temperatures and find the activation energy. The script, uh, we will be using this script and we will use 3 by 3 by 3 supercell and create one carbon atom in 3 by 3 by 3 supercell and then we will replicate it again. So by doing this, there will be uh, 4 times 4 times 4, 64 carbon atoms. And there will be 3,456 ion uh, atoms. So that corresponds to 0.4 weight percent of carbon. Uh, we will create velocity, energy velocity. Uh, I forgot to mention that the initial velocity is not important because the system will be, will go to the, will be equilibrated soon. So the initial temperature is not important. But if you do not initialize the temp initial velocity, if you don't write this velocity command, then the time, uh, it will take more time to equilibrate. So you should write this velocity command. 
and we will be doing constant temperature MVT simulation. And we define group, which is named CC, as a atom type 2. So all carbon atoms will be assigned into this group. And we compute MSD of this CC group. So this my MSD will contain the MSD mean square displacement of carbon atoms. And using this uh, fixed point command, we will be printing step, temperature, and fourth element of my MSD into a file at every 10 steps. So we are printing first element of my MSD. That's because this compute MSD produce a vector. And the first element is the MSD mean squared displacement in x direction. And the second one is in y direction. And the third one is in z direction. And the fourth one is the total mean squared displacement. So we want this fourth element. Since it has very many atoms, it will take quite long. So If you open 4,000, uh, 4,300 dot file, this is the pre computed output of the simulation. And the uh, second, first column is the step, and the second column is temperature, and the third column is mean square displacement. So by using this data, we can obtain diffusion coefficient. So if we plot first column versus third column, You can see the diffusion uh, mean square displacement and the time step. So, if we calculate the slope of this uh, means this graph, we can obtain its diffusion coefficient. The slope corresponds to 6d. However, as you can see here. This figure is very uh, has very many fluctuations, so it's not easy to obtain diffusion coefficient from this figure. So, I if you want to calculate diffusion coefficient more accurately, you will need much larger cell, and you will have to run this simulation for much longer. So, if you uh, if you simulate with uh, 11,880 atoms with for six, 60 picosecond, you can obtain graphs like this. So here, you can obtain the slope of the, this graph more accurately. If you uh, obtain this diffusion coefficient at different temperatures, for example, at uh, 900 and 1,000, 1,100 and 1,300 Kelvin, then you have three diffusion coefficient at three temperature. Then you can plot this figure. 
So the y axis is uh, diffusion coefficient in log scale, and the x axis is uh, inverse temperature. So because the diffusion coefficient follows this equation, if you plot this uh, figure, the slope will be related to activation energy. So you can obtain the activation energy of diffusion from this simulation. Next, we will do some annealing simulations. So by uh, doing annealing, we can escape local minimum and find the global minimum if we anneal it very slowly. So, the first example is uh, silicon interstitial. So this is a very easy one because it will go to more stable tetragonal interstitial really quickly. So this script has nothing special. So you create a silicon split interstitial and minimize, and then. Mm, Annealing it at 300 Kelvin for 5 picoseconds and then minimize the final, final structure. Then you can see it goes to the tetragonal interstitial and we can obtain its structure. So here, we will be uh, annealing SI110 surface to see its reconstruction. Here we define uh, lattice and create 110 surface and use torsion of potential. And here we create initial velocity and we will first anneal uh, this structure at 600 Kelvin for 100 picosecond. And then here unfix means remove the fix. So we defined fix named on in here. And we remove this fix with unfix command. And then we uh, define a new MVT fix to lower the temperature from 600 Kelvin to 300 Kelvin during 100 picosecond. And then we will be doing uh, 300 Kelvin MVT simulation for 10 picosecond to equilibrate the system and then minimize the structure to obtain a reconstructed surface structure. So it will take really long since we have to do more than 200 picosecond simulation. Uh, since uh, the reason this simulation takes much longer than the previous one is that uh, this surface reconstruction is much difficult to find the global minimum. So its potential on the surface is more uh, complex. So we have to cool down it very slowly to obtain global uh, minimum. So this 
So if we uh, look at six movie that that file with VMD, you can see the result. Uh, since it is now represented with point, you will have to change it. So graphics, representations, and change the drawing method to, for example, CPK or VDW. And you can also use dynamic points with current representation and increase the uh, distance cutoff. Then you can see the structure of silicon surface. So as you can see here, at first, the surface is not reconstructed. And as time goes on, as it fluctuates with thermal energy, it gets constructed, reconstructed. So it will, find, it will go from uh, multiple configurations. So there can be multiple reconstructions which correspond to local minimum. So it will go from this configuration to that configuration. And finally, it will find its global minimum position like this. This might not be a global minimum, but close to global minimum. And if you plot the energy versus time, you can see uh, the energy goes down as the surface is reconstructed. And then uh, this energy is going down because the temperature is going down. 